Surprise, Arkhamites! Bet you thought you'd seen The Last of Us. Even though we haven't had any news on Batwoman's renewal yet, we just miss you all way too much to remain silent much longer. So today we're bringing you a very special episode of your favorite Batwoman-centric podcast. The Batman's recent arrival to HBO Max and the fact we haven't been able to stop thinking about this film since we first watched it in theaters have allowed us the perfect opportunity to make a brief comeback. As always, my name is Inej and I will be your host for today's episode. Joining me in this special is my lovely co-host, Fran. Hello! How have you been doing since we last spoke? Uh, really good, really busy, um, working, writing, but I do really miss our sessions, our weekly sessions. <laughs> me too. With that being said, unfortunately, uh, Anna, our third co-host, isn't able to make it to today's recording, uh, so we've had to outsource who we hope you'll consider a worthy replacement, our dear friend and today's very special guest, Kika. Hey, girl! Yeah. Hi! I'm Kika. I don't have much to say about me. I, uh, I'm interested in um, media in general, and... My current obsessions include anime and manga, so my knowledge on anything DC related or, to be honest, movie related is very limited, but I'll try for your sake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Of course. Thank you. Well, this is a good time to remind you that you too can participate in these conversations. So feel free to join us for a chat on social media, where you can find us on both Twitter and Instagram at Arkham underscore archives. That's Arkham underscore archives. Without any further ado, let's get into some trouble. For anyone who's been making a point of living under a rock, The Batman is a superhero film starring Robert Pattinson as the Dark Knight, which had its premiere early in March of this year. When the Riddler begins murdering key political figures in Gotham, Batman is forced to investigate the city's hidden corruption and question his own family's involvement, making this a detective film in addition to its superhero genre. Before we start getting into the nitty and gritty of this film, I want to know, what were your first impressions of the Batman? Um, so, when I left the cinema, my head was just going on and on and on around the everything that I just, that I had just watched. And it was, you know, I'm not one for uh, watching films, as we'll surely mention throughout uh, this episode. <laughs> um, so uh, for me to actually sit down and watch such a long film and leave the cinema in complete awe, that's a rarity. And I feel like I definitely uh, left the that little cinema room feeling positively overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> due to the quality and at how impressed I truly was. It was such a good experience. Yeah. Yeah, I second that. I, I think my feeling coming out of the theater was mostly that I was really glad that this movie existed and that I got to experience it in... Uh, the cinema because I was originally planning on waiting until it came out on streaming. I was really glad, really glad that I didn't do that because it's meant to be watched on the big screen. It's done in such a larger scale than uh, most recent uh, superhero movies, and I, that includes even No Way, uh, No Way Home, and these major events that have been happening because. I feel like it was very meticul meticulously done and every detail was taken into consideration and it was made with a kind of love and dedication that I haven't seen in a long time with superhero movies. So mostly I was just really happy because it, uh, like you mentioned Inez, it, it unites two of my favorite genres which is crime thrillers and the superhero genre. Mm -hmm. So. Basically, I was just really happy that it was done that it was done so well and that it exists because it's original at a time where it's very hard to make original movies. 
Can I just add a little um, note here? Um, it's just that uh, while you mentioned that it is so meticulously made, uh, which is unseen, mostly unseen in most recent uh, superhero movies, I actually uh, remembered. I've, I'm not sure if you guys watched it, but uh, Logan. Mm -hmm. I, I have. haven't yet. Um, and I, I, I truly feel like Logan was that one superhero film that really stuck with me. Similarly to Batman, to this, the 2022 Batman. Um, I felt like both uh, films truly uh, just made me um, fall in love with this little genre of um, more intense films, which DC tends to make, but not Marvel. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why I loved Logan so much. And I feel the exact same thing while watching Batman. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm very glad that we all got to experience it in the theater, especially you, Fran, because you really came down to the wire with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I watched it twice at the movies, as the girls know, one of the times in IMAX, and it was definitely worth the money. Getting to experience certain scenes, certain sequences in a big screen definitely makes up for, I mean, not makes up, but makes for a, a very true experience. Uh, I didn't come out of the movie, you know unchanged i felt like a different person mm -hmm. coming out uh especially because i personally didn't have a lot of expectations to this movie because uh spoiler alert about me i'm not the greatest fan of batman despite you know running a batwoman podcast <laughs> um i don't know the the dark knight not the movie itself but the whole concept was never that enticing to me and here we have a film that explored it really well and not just for a superhero fan but like fran put it to someone who enjoys true crime uh in this mm -hmm. case not true crime fictional crime of course but a uh, crime nonetheless and yeah i really think it was overall a great experience i absolutely loved watching the movie uh and i definitely appreciated the you know the whole experience that comes with watching something at a theater you know you just know when you come out of a great film. And I think overthinking it ruins the experience because if your heart is pounding and you're like, whoa, what did I just watch? Then you just need mm -hmm. to uh, let that feeling uh, run wild and just go with it because that's what movies are supposed to make you feel. And of course, if you're thinking, if you're going into it with a critical mindset, you're always gonna find flaws. And I'm sure we're gonna uh, talk about some of them going forward. But if a movie makes you feel like that, then, you know, it's a good one. Even mm -hmm. if it has little flaws, of course, it's very hard to make a perfect movie. Yeah. But Batman was very close to it, especially if you consider superhero movies. Absolutely. This being one amongst many Batman iterations in media, but particularly in film to date, and knowing you, Fran, have a soft spot for 2008's The Dark Knight, how do you personally think the Batman compares to those movies that came before? I think um, the Batman and Bruce as characters are just very cool to put on film, uh, especially uh, if you consider, you know, man's interests. I feel like they're it's a very manly um, superhero, it's a very manly character, and it's kind of a dream character for uh, male comic book fans, and mm -hmm. that's why it has been redone so many times, kind of like the Joker. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it always works, I think, in my opinion. I know you're not a big fan of it, Inish, but I think action-wise, Batman always brings that excitement and uh, the flair and the richness and um, the double life and the fact that Bruce Wayne is just loaded also always works mm -hmm. really well to uh, create uh, really, really big moments for 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 film, for, for the cinema. But 
I think my favorite part about Dark Knight, despite it being an amazing film, is the pleasure. He's one of my favorite actors, and uh, for me, that film is him. And it's not really about Christian Bale or the Batman. Even though mm -hmm. I think that it carries a lot of the same themes and motives of uh, the Batman, the 2022 uh, film being uh, about crime and corruption. And it also has, you know, uh, Harvey Two-Face. That's his name, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's also a government official who eventually becomes corrupted, I think. And the Joker also uh, in that movie explores a lot of um, that idea that every person is uh, eventually going to be corrupted when their personal safety is put at risk, which I think the Riddler kind of wanted to prove as well in this movie. But Yeah, and I mean, I think he did. I will talk about it later, but I guess that he did. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, lot, it's a really similar movie, and it's become kind of a dude-bro film with time, mm -hmm. but... I think they're both really great, and I think the Batman is also going to become a dude bro film because yeah. it's just a dude bro superhero character. Not on our watch, though. Which speaks to them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, I actually uh, agree and disagree um, with you at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm siding with Inish when it comes to not enjoying uh, Bruce's character that much. I the the entire uh idea behind batman isn't as appealing to me and i think that's exactly why it's a dude bro type of character that was made and inspired by male audiences yeah um, i agree and it is definitely that type of superhero that as a matter of fact, it was the second superhero, I believe, DC made after Superman. Mm, so probably. it came from a time where, similarly to Superman, uh, which existed because of Second World War and they needed an American icon to defeat the Nazis. This is obviously an assumption, but the Batman probably came to be around a similar time. Um, so it probably also derived from that time where they needed uh, a new hero. Mm -hmm. And although it uh, will talk about it, but he's not entirely a hero, of course. Uh, he's a very multi-dimensional character. But um, what I what I'm trying to say is that I don't sympathize with uh, Bruce that much i don't enjoy his character that much and although i did like the dark knight and i think christopher nolan did a great job at directing the film and christian bale also did a fantastic job but that movie was carried by heath yeah mm -hmm. like you said that movie's heath uh which i find to be um a little, uh, I don't want to say boring, but uh, a little underwhelming if we consider that we're trying to watch a film about Bruce Wayne yeah. and about the Batman and we see the, the villain shine. And so that's why I think I personally uh, have a soft spot for this year's Batman, whereas with the dark knight i even though i enjoyed it thoroughly i don't think um it did as great of a job uh trying to separate the characters and the uh, screen time uh for us to f to enjoy each character in a equal way yeah i i have to say i really enjoyed this film in comparison to the dark knight for example because i think that the batman does a really good job at portraying bruce being human you know like we see a lot of bruce not just as batman but a lot about him being himself and I don't know, I got a connection with this movie that I didn't get watching The Dark Knight. Mostly because, like you said, The Dark Knight felt very much like the Joker's film to me. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. no trouble in that because it's great. 
in that regard, but it didn't feel yeah. like a Batman movie to me. And with yeah. me not being a Batman fan, you'd think that would help the movie, but it yeah, doesn't. You're also not a Joker <laughs> fan, so it didn't. Exactly. Like, <laughs> between being a Batman fan and a Joker fan, we all know where they rank in my in my personal mm -hmm. ranking. So, um, and I really appreciated that the villain of this movie wasn't a Joker. I'll just put that out there. Yeah. Same. Yeah, for sure. Um, that was innovative. Now that is something <laughs> I I really enjoy. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But now we are <laughs> probably going to get a Joker movie, so that's why I'm kind of yeah. bummed out. Yeah, yeah, but we'll save that for the final question. Okay. <laughs> but. But yeah, I feel like it was an overall great movie in a way that I hadn't seen in a while. Not just in the superhero genre, like especially in the superhero genre, of course, but in television as a whole. Because I don't watch a lot of movies anyway, I hadn't seen one that had me gripped quite like this in a long time. We need to watch more movies. <sighs> I know, but I hate movies. <laughs> Same. I don't like Same watching bestie. movies. Anyways, anyways. <laughs> but you know, our movie nights will change that, I'm sure. I think if you talk about which movie is the best movie between The Dark Knight and The Batman, um, that's uh, fodder for I think like... that's completely up for the person yeah, who yeah. watches it. That's, that's food for like a very long podcast episode. <laughs> but... In the mm -hmm. end, I think we all agree that the Batman 2022 is the best Bruce Wayne movie of the two. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. definitely. So. so, diversity of opinion is probably going to be an issue during this special. Not about everything, as we just showed, but about a lot for sure. But one thing I believe there's no possible argument against is how breathtakingly beautiful the Batman is. There are quite a few shots or sequences that really made me go, wow, this is a film. <laughs> um, I agree. I think it definitely had an identity and a, a vision that I think mi is missing from a lot of superhero movies. Mm -hmm. Again, I think you, you need to watch more movies, but <laughs> <laughs> regardless, regardless, yeah, it is a really beautiful film. And it takes a lot from, I think, a lot of popular um, filmmakers at the moment. Uh, just like the Joker was like a copy of Taxi Driver, Martin Scorsese's mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. This film felt very David Fincher inspired. And yes. you see a lot of the references. So that's why I think, that's why I was saying like, you need to watch more movies just because it, it's very clear where the inspiration comes from. It's not a bad thing. But it, it did, it was a good and a successful, I would say, homage or tribute to the kind of filmmakers that have been doing these crime thrillers in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, it also reminded me of Denis Villeneuve's The uh, Prisoners, uh, which curiously, Kiko was talking about Logan, it stars Hugh Jackman. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just reminded me of those films, the kind of very dark aesthetic and the dirtiness of the city and the dirtiness yeah. of criminality and what the worst uh, in people looks like. And yeah, it, it, it works really, really well. I loved it. Also, the fact that it's set almost entirely at night is really mm -hmm. great. Yeah, um, I I, uh, I find it so funny that you mentioned all of that. I had never, again, never considered any of it, but it's actually, um, you know, I also don't watch many films in general. Um, he used to, though. However, <laughs> Exactly, I used to. So um, that's why I'm someone who enjoys aesthetics. So seeing something so aesthetically pleasing is calming to me. I used to... Um, my favorite uh, directors include, like you said, Martin Scorsese, David Fincher, uh, Wes Anderson. All of those directors who really put their time in uh, getting beautiful shots and I'll even mention David Fincher's Zodiac which yeah. is also about uh, crime and in this case true crime and uh, yeah the the fact that the scenes are at night like you said and that it falls around a crime focused 
plot. It, it definitely brings out how beautiful and aesthetically nice the, the film is. And all of those mentions to directors definitely do make a lot of sense. Kik, have you watched Seven? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> I actually haven't watched Seven. I know I would love it. Yeah, you would. I, know the, I, would I read it was it. an inspiration for this yeah, movie. Yeah, the scenes in the... I didn't read anything, but the scenes in Riddler's house really reminded me of the scenes where Brad Pitt uh, goes into mm -hmm. the serial killer's Uh, we, who is Kevin Spacey, but we don't need to talk about him. But anyways, <laughs> uh, he goes into the serial killer's house in Seven, and it's so, 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 so similar to Riddler's house. Like, the scenes are almost identical. And I, I think I will be kind of hypocritical because I've criticized the Joker so, so much for being like an almost direct copy of, the, of Taxi Driver. The taxi Driver, yeah. But I don't know. I feel like with the Batman, I'm being nicer in that regard. But there is a lot of heavy influencing for sure. Yeah, it also, I don't think it, that's uh, such a stretch because I ha personally haven't watched um, the Joker I know Joaquin Phoenix It's a movie. A, must have done a great job, but I heard that it is a copy paste of Taxi Driver. And I mean, obviously, you've watched a lot more films than I have, but I don't think this movie was a direct copy of anything. It was just inspired, inspired by. It, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It probably. Uh, Who is it? Is it Matt Reeves? Probably uh, took a little bit of inspiration here and there, and I don't think that's a crime. Um, well, inspired or not, I genuinely think that Matt Reeves nailed the whole noir aesthetic of this movie, which, as you mentioned, it works wonders with both the detective genre and this being Gotham of all places. And I think that's something that really drove me towards the Batman. Like, there's a whole story unraveling, not just through the plot, of course, with Batman attempting to decipher what the Riddlers left him, but in great part through the cinematography and the association of certain, certain images with specific ideas. So, do you have any moment that really stood out with you? Because I do, and mine is a rather obvious one, but I think there's plenty to pick from, so I'll let you go first. Your uh, audience obviously doesn't know this, but I'm not someone who tends to overanalyze or read between the lines that much. <laughs> uh, maybe on some things uh, that I'm interested on, but in most films or, or TV series, I'm really not that uh, attentive or nor do I try to nitpick or, on anything, but I definitely felt like... Uh, Most of these movies have some ominous scenes that mm -hmm. um, try to portray and give an idea of something that will happen. Like you were saying uh, before, um, about not before, but before the podcast, about the beacon of light and Batman being uh, the shadows. I would love to, for you to explore and expand a bit on that because I, I think that's quite interesting even though I'm not someone who tries to find more about what this might mean and how ominous it is. I just see it <laughs> and I accept it as is. <laughs> However, I do find it interesting. Um, the theories that might come up or the, the connections that people might make. You are a very objective person, and I really appreciate that about you most of the time. Um, but Some of the time. Most of no, the most time. of the time. Come on. Most of the time, from being like, please, stop it. From being like, none of the time. <laughs> How is the beacon of light something that's between the lines? Like, it's very in the lines, written in bold. Yeah, but that's exactly why I don't find it... Um, plot point as per se because it's there 
we see it, we make the connection immediately. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think but it's the uh, way I see it might be a bit different from Inej, who might make another connection. True. Yeah, it leaves think... more up for for interpretation, but I think it's very easy also to tell stories through images, uh, which is mm-hmm. which is what Inez was, I think was trying to get to. Even though words and dialogue are very used, I think the thing about movies and watching stuff that is on a screen instead of on paper is that images carry the same weight as words. And I think the Batman in general did that really well. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to remember sp- um, specific occasions because the two of you have only watched the movie one time. And there's a lot I personally only picked up on my rewatch. Um but yeah like you were saying i personally think that you know there are things where if you're reinforcing the idea through the visuals even if there's no dialogue that it can be a bit on the nose and most of the times it is going to be but i also think that the batman managed to do them in such an aesthetically pleasing way that, you know, they worked. Yeah, uh, sure. The Beacon of Light, for example, is one that really stood out to me. And I think that the moments that really stood out for me in that regard were, first of all, at the beginning of the movie, the opening sequence with uh, the Batman appearing from the darkness, not really appearing, but giving off the impression of appearing from the dark spots in Gotham. And those scaring criminals away uh and that whole idea of him being this oppressive force over the city and keeping crime down like like so and that tying into you know bruce's journey of realizing that he can't just be an oppressive force if he really wants to change his city because crime is going up in gotham despite him being the batman for two years uh and him realizing that he actually has to bring hope to the people of Gotham if he actually wants to change anything. Uh, and that being tied in with the moment where after the flood, he's in the stadium and he has this beacon and he's carrying people out and people are following him. So kind of like he's learned that he has to lead by example and lead by being a kind force instead of just, you know, beating up the shit out of bad guys. And which I bet he will still do. Of course he will. I mean, the whole gist about Batman is that he beats up mentally ill people. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, let's be honest. That's that's what he does. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, but uh, I think the Batman uses this color palette that I often associate with Batwoman, especially in its dark scenes with the reds and the blacks and the grays and what have you but you know that's that's part of the reason why the shot in the water with him holding the red beacon is one of my favorites uh, and definitely a standout moment for me in the ep- uh, in the, not the episode in the movie uh, but then i also like for example the scene at the cemetery when he and uh selena part ways mm-hmm. and you know they have that little moment riding around in their motorcycles and then they have to yeah it was just beautiful you know it's on the nose because of course you know that they are physically parting ways but it was done in such a beautiful way and with no dialogue there's like not a lot of dialogue at all in this movie and those little moments where there's no spoken words and you're just seeing that and going through it are so beautiful to me and i really love them but yeah aside from that as we mentioned it's a pretty movie and some of my favorite shots like standalone shots from the movie are funnily enough not during the night they're mostly either at dawn or you know something like that uh so the shots between Bruce and Selena in the parking lot when the sun is rising or setting, I can't remember at the moment, uh, are just beautiful to me. Uh, Yeah, there's that shot where it's just their silhouettes, which I think is really beautiful. And then um, I don't think there's a lot of narrative uh, weight to this scene besides just the director Mm -hmm. flexing. (laughs) Uh, 
his abilities to direct action yeah. sequences, but I love yeah. the car chase between oh, yeah. uh, the Batman and Penguin. That was so sick. Uh, it's just really well mm -hmm. made and uh, very exciting to watch, and especially on the Weren't big screen. Weren't you anxious? I was so anxious <laughs> during that time. Also, in theaters, the sound is so loud, so yeah. everything was so loud, and I was, like, uh, gripping my seat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was totally immersive, and the way that it was shot as well, with the perspective shots and uh, everything was so, so, so well done. Mm -hmm. And it, it lasted so long, but you almost wanted it to keep going. Yeah. It was so good. It was an edge-of-your-seat type of scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was... I, I was <laughs> holy shit, I was <laughs> legit... I. I was just gripping my seat for dear life and I w in that moment I was like I'm never getting my license <laughs> what if this shit just happened to Literally. me while I was just driving to work <laughs> and suddenly I have Batman in his uh, little Batmobile and just completely driving through me and ah oh, no i'm never getting my license that's what i learned about them uh, with with this film <laughs> literally i can almost imagine your five foot self white knuckling the, <laughs> the chair at the movie yeah <laughs> <laughs> and being like let, let me out <laughs> this is giving me ptsd <laughs> Uh, but yeah I think that was a really well directed scene and I really love the shot when uh, the penguin capsizes his car and we see Bruce mm -hmm, approaching mm -hmm. him uh, and the camera is upside down of course uh, that was a moment yeah I know <laughs> <laughs> anyway moving on <laughs> because we could talk about you know many shots of this movie I think the longer we stay here the more we can think about them so uh, yeah. but for what I assume is the first time at least the first time for me we really got to see a very expanded criminal underbelly of Gotham uh, with established characters alliances what have you none of this felt like an introduction to well, to anything, really. And I truly appreciate that. It's not an origin story like many who came before, but it also doesn't provide us with a thoroughly seasoned Batman. So while Fred and, Frey and I are somewhat DC connoisseurs by now, I'd love to know how it felt to you, Kika, to come into this film being expected to know everyone and everything that's going on. Did you feel overwhelmed? I feel like it was rather easy. The thing is, I'm not entirely um, going in into Batman without any type of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've watched quite a few uh, DC films and I've also read a few comics because I used to be a big comic fan. Uh, mostly Marvel, but uh, I've also read a few DC ones, mostly Joker and Harley related. And and yeah, I've um, as a, a former comic fan, I know a little bit about DC in general. But um, the thing is, I don't think it was that difficult mm -hmm. to keep up with, including the characters. I feel like this movie um, wasn't that uh, wasn't calling out on major events or major ideas mm -hmm. from other uh, medium, for, from any other medium, whether it was comics or films. I, I don't think it had any moments that I didn't notice and wasn't like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't know who that is, I'll just forget about it. I would immediately notice that it was uh, some sort of reference and I don't think it was that difficult to keep up with. That's also the thing with superhero movies. Uh, even though you may not know much about the cinematic universe, you, you'll you immediately get it. I don't think they are... Um, s some of them are, but most of them are pretty on the nose. Uh, yeah, Kika, I definitely agree with you. I just mean that, for example, in a movie like uh, Wonder Woman, for example... <sighs> you are introduced to these characters and they don't know each other. So you get to know them as they know each other. And I feel like with the Batman, it's not hard to keep up at all. 
in my opinion, you know, even knowing. Uh, but it's not hard to keep up because it's already established that everyone knows each other, sort of. And I think it lends to a lot in the yeah. movie, you know, that you are not... Even as a, a viewer, you can be meeting them for the first time, but that familiarity and the amount mm -hmm. that certain characters appear, you almost only have to know about them at certain key points. Uh, how do I put this? Like, it's not like they're not important to the big picture. It's that they have moments where they're mm -hmm, very exactly. relevant and you definitely know who they are. Yeah. I think, Ines, what you mean is that there aren't any big exposition yeah. scenes. So you don't have like a, t a, c a character going on and on about their very uh, complicated plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You don't sit down and have the big bad guy tell you blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. They show yeah. it to you. Like Roman Sion um, is in Birds of Prey. In that one scene. Actually, I also want to add a little um, on, on that. I think the thing about... Uh, we've talked about this, um, especially you and I, Ines, mm -hmm. regarding comics having so many plots. Yeah. <laughs> because of so many existing comics. So he, he may mention someone from one random comic and not make it a big scene because maybe it won't be a major character that that's the thing about uh superhero films he, he may mention something from a timeline on the comics and in another timeline those characters never interact yeah so i think that's yeah. why they chose very uh particular characters to introduce in films mm -hmm. but in another film in another timeline with the same characters those, those those interactions won't exist. Yeah. And that's also what I dislike about comics. But what I also wanted to add is that although I am not a connoisseur on DC, I was a Marvel fan for a long time. So the fact that all of these intricate um, connections exist between characters oh, of course. is not a foreign concept I mean, to me. DC, of course, has struggled with building any type of fucking universe which you know mm -hmm. i've talked about this yeah. with yeah. you girls before and we'll probably do a special on this sometime soon i don't think that's a requirement like imagine if dc made good standalone movies i'd be okay with that i don't need you the, know the i see the value universe. in that especially because i've become more of a marvel fan with the past couple of years and the new stuff they have been putting out and I definitely see the value in mm -hmm. having the same characters played by the same actors in different projects mm -hmm. that all intertwine. Especially when it comes to money. <laughs> of course. Um, and, you know, I definitely see the value in that. But I like good standalone movies. And I think The Batman was a very good standalone movie. Uh, when it comes to... Okay, but now, comes, but yeah. don't act like you weren't calling for a Catwoman... No, I am. And saying how you wanted mm -hmm. all of this universe mm -hmm. built on this Batman movie and how you were saying DC was finally going to have its cinematic universe. Look, I, no, I wasn't saying DC was finally going <laughs> to have its cinematic universe. I said that, I did say that if all the movies started resembling the, not just the aesthetic, because, for example, I love Birds of Prey. Uh, I know that's a controversial statement, but I love Birds of Prey. I think it fits Harley's character a lot. I didn't really like how... Um, how do I put this? I didn't quite like how the movie treated the other characters because it felt like a Harley movie, and I think it worked great as a Harley movie. But as a whole, if DC were to build a, a universe from scratch, I would love for them to do that in the vein that the Batman is set because I think it just works great with Gotham especially um, and yeah if DC would you know wake up today and decide to scrap you know Justice League and Wonder Woman especially the new one uh, and the other movies and be like okay so now we're gonna set a timeline from the Batman onwards I wouldn't be upset with that at all 
with that being said though and knowing that won't happen that would be really messy though yeah <laughs> uh, and knowing that won't happen i really appreciate the batman for what it is i'm scared of what they will do with it in the future uh because you know once you start poking too much into something that worked well it tends to ruin yeah. it <laughs> Well, we both know how difficult it is to get Kika to watch any film, let alone one that's a little over three hours long. I think that's a true, a true testament to the script behind the Batman. So I guess what I'm saying with all of this is that, in my opinion, of course, this film has managed to achieve quite a nice pacing with its intrigue. You know, being able to create several well-constructed climaxes within its runtime. And I have to ask you girls, was there any point in this movie that had you checking your phone, counting the hours until it was over, or were you just riding the highs? Uh, in my case, never. And like you said, it's so difficult to get me to watch any film in general, uh, let alone a three hour long film. And yet, uh, I'm not sure if this is happening in every country, but I don't think we have uh, breaks in theaters anymore mm -hmm. here. No, we don't. And um, the fact that I didn't miss the break at all. As a matter of fact, I think if I if we had gotten a break, that would have fucked up the experience, made me upset, and that would have made me uh, lose my pacing. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. so into the film that if I had to stop. I, I don't think I would have enjoyed uh, nearly as much as I did. So n I n not even once considered checking my phone or wishing for a break because I think it's the perfect film to watch for three hours without stopping. Yeah, I uh, went to the theater to watch Uncharted, the Tom Holland movie, the day before mm -hmm. I went to watch The Batman. And I think that's a two hour and a little something long movie. And it had been one hour and we were looking at our phones thinking, how the hell do we still have to go through another hour of this? And that was only two hours. And it was also an action movie, like it's not a slowed, <laughs> slowed but, down movie. But, but... That's because it is an adaptation of a video game, which is really cool and really nice, and they ha should have never tried to make yeah, a film yeah. out of it. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, when I was watching Uncharted, yeah, time was going by slowly, and with the Batman, I didn't feel like it was a short movie per se. Like, I felt the, the time go by, but... I love long movies and I think the Batman deserved every second of the movie, mm -hmm. like it earned the se every second of the movie. It filled its time correctly, like it wasn't just flexing a three hour long runtime. it actually needed mm -hmm. it and uh, it did a great time, it, it did a great uh, job with the, the three hour long runtime, mm -hmm. I think. I remember I found myself, especially during the first time, checking my my phone for the hours but not because i was bored by the movie uh, i usually did so when we went through some sort of climax just to look and see okay what's next how many time do we still have you know because it felt like we hit yeah. a yeah. high after a high after a high and still the main conflict wasn't solved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I was like on the edge of my seat every time. Like, is it now? Is it now? How long do we have left? And then when he catches the Riddler finally, I look at my phone and we still have like 40 minutes of the movie to go. And it's like, what mm -hmm. the hell is going to happen next? <laughs> so I was looking at my phone, yes, but for what I will say were the right reasons this time. Uh, that I see what you mean. I definitely see what you mean. It's like uh, the movie didn't have just one climax. It had constant mm -hmm. ones. So it was always on its highs. And yeah, the it was like the main conflict wasn't solved. So we just kept going and going and giving and giving. Yeah, the last stretch from the time that we learned Thomas's past and what he did all the way until um, 
Falcone is killed and then the Riddler is captured and then the whole scene in the stadium is just so incredible and it felt like an entire movie on its own climax <laughs> whereas yeah, yeah yeah whereas usually it's like a half hour maybe climax to movies this time mm -hmm. it was hit after hit after hit revelation after revelation and yeah you were just gasping for her, for air in that last hour, which is when people usually start losing their patience. That's in the mm -hmm. last hour when it's a three hour long movie. You're like, okay, when does this end? We, we get it already. But no, with the Batman, they really hit the moment that they were supposed to really pick up the pace to carry people and to carry the viewers all the way for, uh, for the, la the last stretch. And... It was really, really mm -hmm. well done. Because, and now yeah. that you mention it, because the movie starts out kind of mellow with all taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. And then you have the car chase and it's picking up from there. Like the car chase is probably the most like thriller in inducing moment in the, the whole film. Mm -hmm. But it still manages to like ride off that high and keep it going through the rest of the movie. So, yeah, I think it was very well done. And I really think that the humor in this movie is spot on for the type of vibe they were going for, but also to keep, like, a bit of that momentum going. Like, you have these yeah. funny little quips. Uh, the thumb drive, for example, was <laughs> fucking hilarious to me. Mm -hmm. I... <laughs> I, it was, you know, it was one of those jokes that I almost wanted to slap my forehead with a how, you know, not stupid. I'm not going to say stupid because it wasn't stupid, but, you know, with how obvious it was, but it worked and it was... I like that they, they were kind of making fun of the Riddler when he did those things because he thought that he, it was so cool. And then you had Gordon and uh, the Batman kind of going like, this guy... This guy really gets it, huh? <laughs> and that was really funny. <laughs> yeah. Like, he thinks he's brilliant. And then, you know, you have uh, the Batman in this deadpan voice going, Thumb, drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I also know you have uh, some funny moments of your own friend that we were talking about earlier. Uh, yeah, when, the, when they were trying to figure out what El Rata Alada meant... And you had uh, the one Italian guy. I think the penguin is Italian, I no? I think so. I mean, he's part of the mafia, so I'm... That's being... Am I being <laughs> Italian phobic <laughs> right now? <laughs> yeah, it's problematic. Yeah. As other, as fellow Mediterranean, we can be Italian phobic. <laughs> True. We can, but I, I mean, I'm... I'm... I'm imagining that by being Italian, he wouldn't think, he wouldn't make such a mistake. It's a romantic language. Come on, dude. No, exactly. He was the one pointing out the mistake to Bruce oh, yeah, and Gordon. Right, right. But his name, I think, Ines, you wrote down here is Oswald Quebblepot. That doesn't sound <laughs> Italian. Okay, <laughs> wait, no, I have to Google now. This is bothering me. Okay, apparently he's American, so fuck <laughs> Boo! Okay, in my head, in our heads. At least he knows yeah. Spanish. Anyways, that moment was really funny, but I also wanted to talk about um, the way that the movie, uh, when we were talking about how it earned the three hours, I think something that really needs to be highlighted is the way that it was really bold in, the, um, in its decision to introduce not introduce like you mentioned it was uh, in media race but into to like tackle so many different characters of the dc lore you had a whole plethora of characters and you have like all of the uh, ranks in the police uh, all of the ranks in the in the government and all these little chess pieces and then it's really well connected and they never really miss anything there's there's not a lot of plot holes even though there could be because so much is uh thrown into the narrative mm -hmm. and i think especially what i really loved was with kind of alfred and falcone and even the penguin and gordon and thomas and martha and even selena you started these characters and you met them at, in the beginning of the film and then you had this whole storyline for them. It had a middle, it had a start and mm -hmm. middle and an ending and there were so many characters that that 
could have not happened with a lot of them, but it did. There were so many chances for plot holes, and yet they nailed every turn, and I thought that was really, really cool. And that's why I think it earned the three hours, because it had a lot of characters, and they were all really well uh, built and connected between them. All right, let's get into the characters. As we all know, Robert Pattinson is the lead behind the Batman, which caused quite a fuss when it was first announced. It's safe to say we didn't get the Playboy billionaire we're accustomed to, but I think we got something a lot more valuable and down-to-earth in its place. In my personal opinion, I think Robert did a great job with this emo-type brooding version of The Dark Knight, which suited his personal journey throughout the movie. What did you think, though, about his performance here? I haven't personally watched many uh, Robert films, uh, but I have watched Good Time and I think The Lighthouse had really, really good reviews. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Robert uh, has a has the usual image that everyone has in their mind of him playing the sparkly vampire, you know, <laughs> the, um, from Twilight. So uh, many people don't associate him with a with a superhero actor or even a, a normal uh, type of film actor that isn't associated with comics or superheroes. Or in people might not even give him a chance because of that, because they always associate him with Twilight, which is absolutely s dumb, <laughs> uh, to say the least. He's he's a he's a really complex actor, and uh, I think he really show showed us that in this film. Um, I think he really portrayed a version of Bruce that I I actually enjoyed. <laughs> which is rare because like we said before uh neither Inez or I are big fans of Bruce Wayne as a character nor the Batman as a superhero so um, it was really interesting to actually see a character with so little lines and yet being so well portrayed um mm -hmm. in its own way I, I still don't think Bruce is an interesting character I don't, <laughs> but I think he was definitely interesting to watch uh, in this film. Even if he was an emo boy, it's fine. It was fine. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything that Kika said, and particularly a scene that comes to mind that I think Robert really nailed was the scene at the hospital with Alfred. Mm -hmm. I think... Mm. Uh, that was really emotional and even if it was toned down because it wouldn't make sense for Bruce to have a big show of emotions but I I loved the way he handled that scene. Mm -hmm. I personally really liked the the emo brooding type that we got because we have to remember like he's still grieving his parents death and also he hasn't been Batman for that long. So it makes a lot of sense that he's not, you know, out there being a playboy billionaire. Like, he's just mm. some guy, you know? Especially because most yeah. millionaires we know of aren't the Tony Stark type of guys, you know? They're usually people who live very chill, chill lives. And, you know, this is a weird guy. This is, a, this is someone who's mostly awake at night. He doesn't have many people he interacts with. Outside of the criminal world, of course. And I also found it very interesting that Robert isn't like a very muscled guy. At least we don't associate him with those mm -hmm. type of roles, as you were saying, Kika. Yeah. But at the same time, he almost seems like he grows in size when he's the Batman. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like when he's wearing the suit... Uh, mm -hmm. versus when we see him without the suit he he looks very intimidating buff. as the, <laughs> yeah and buff <laughs> as the batman um so yeah i think a lot of people definitely undervalued him in this role not undervalued but they didn't have many expectations for robert in yeah. such a role and i think he nailed it honestly um you're absolutely right he is a an incredibly underrated uh, actor, in my personal opinion, 
and he's been doing so many great indie films that mm -hmm. um that have been overlooked and uh hollywood is thankfully and finally looking at robert pattison and adding him to these mainstream blockbusters that really sell well mm -hmm. uh, in tickets and not just letting him be in the indie movies which also have their own credibility and quality but mm -hmm. um people just don't see that acting side of robert pattison and thankfully this time they did yeah yeah i think it's kind of a two-way street because there was very much an effort from robert to not do mainstream movies mm -hmm. right off after um twilight so that he wouldn't be typecasted or be only offered roles that weren't up to uh, his acting talent, yeah. and I think he went and went off and did all of those indies and really worked on his craft, and that really showed in this movie. And I also think that it, it felt to me that the casting was very intentional by the director. Um, I feel like he was writing the movie with these actors in mind, mm -hmm. uh, sure. both uh, Robert and then Zoe and Paul Dano as the Riddler. Yeah. For some reason, I feel like no one else could have played the roles because they were fit perfectly for the actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, especially um, Paul Dano. I I don't think I could ever picture anyone else playing him, playing the Riddler. Yeah. <laughs> especially this version of the Riddler, yeah. because I haven't personally seen them, but I know there are movies out there that display a very more caricature type yeah. Riddler. So I think this very dark, very incel-like, normy type guy mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. was played Paul to Dano, perfection. You will always catch Paul Dano play playing some kind of incel weirdo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's very good at that. He is. That's why it really was the perfect casting. Yeah. When you think about it, Edward in Twilight was also kind of the emo brooding type. <laughs> he was. Yeah. yeah. This almost feels like a grown-up type of version or a darker type yeah. of version, but he's going it's back to not the far roots. off. Yeah, <laughs> it's like same same title, different font type of yeah. situation. <laughs> Literally, yeah. more highlight, more eyeliner, more eyeliner, <laughs> less sparkles, more eyeliner, more less sparkles, more eyeliner. <laughs> he gave the sparkles to Selena. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, but as Kika mentioned. Uh, I also think it was quite the feat to achieve such a compelling story on such little dialogue from this one actor, at least. I mean, in general, I feel like there's not a lot of dialogue in The Batman. But on that note, I have to say, what a brilliant idea it was to introduce the Bat to a scene through sound and not just image. Because more often than not, we hear the Batman's approach long before we actually get to see him on screen. Which goes along nicely with the whole I am the shadows opening monologue. Uh, and how the mere thought of him looking around serves as a deterrent to criminals. So, going back to that opening of the movie, what was your original impression of this version of the Batman and how did you think the movie was going to play out with him? The voiceover reminded me instantly of Batwoman and I thought he's probably writing a journal <laughs> but then it's just a, because right doesn't Kate like pick up on Bruce's journal in Batwoman and then she continues it yep and all the episodes are narrated by her mm-hmm so that was instantly what I thought about I thought he's writing a journal but then it was really cool because then we see the purpose of him writing a journal, right, later on. is so that he registers everything that he sees so that if there's any investigation or that if he needs to go back to anything that he sees, he has written it down. So I love that, the fact that they justified the journal and it wasn't just a very, like, ominous um, narration going on because I'm not a huge fan of narration mm -hmm. in movies. Uh, but it is true that there wasn't a lot of dialogue, so they needed to show us uh, what Bruce was thinking in a different way because he was not going to 
let other people into uh, whatever he was thinking. So yeah. the, the journal worked and then they justified it, which made it work even better. That's what I mean before when I said that every little thing in the movie had like a beginning and an ending because you could have just had these random narrations put uh, on top of the film for explanation purposes, but then they actually even justified that. Like every little thing made sense, mm -hmm. and that was one of them. And I, I really liked, I really liked the monologues and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kika. And before we get to your opinion, I just have to bounce off of what Fran just said. I really thought the whole idea with the lens capturing everything he sees and that being the way he you know remembers things at the end of the day and is able to put them into yes into writing and stuff i thought that was very clever that was so cool um i thought the opening scenes were really cool to set the tone for the the entire film um yeah I really enjoyed that we saw this badass character that we really don't know much about just yet. I mean, we do because we know who Batman and Bruce Wayne are, but from uh, from the start, we're just trying to get an idea mm -hmm. of how this the character in the film will play out. So it was really, really cool to see him uh, putting fear into everyone's bones and just see everyone uh scattering around like you said uh once they said they saw the batman sign mm -hmm. a signal actually the batman single uh, signal so that was pretty cool and also another thing about the the sound within the film was i don't think we can not mention the soundtrack mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. it's pretty iconic that that they chose Nirvana to play and it also did make a lot of sense it is a Nemo boy a very bro dude character like we said before and he I mean he likes his emo rock music yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much was... that there's that's pretty much all there is to it I really like that they played it in the beginning and in the end. Yeah. And I also love the take on um, Ave Maria that they yeah, did for that was the Riddler. So mm -hmm. good. And we all have a, a musician friend, and she was explaining to me how they altered the original version to make it more creepy. And they really dragged it out and made this really eerie version. Now I don't know if I'm going to be able to listen to Ave Maria and not be very creeped out. Yeah. Uh,. And also, like you said, Fran, everything in this movie feels like it has some kind of purpose. And not to sound like a smart person, because Fran just told me this like five minutes before we started recording. But um, <laughs> I really appreciated that one scene where, you know, you have the music playing and then Bruce goes into the bad cave. And I mean, I don't remember if he goes into the bad cave or if he's there already doing some shit. But either way, when Alfred comes in, he turns down the music. So it's like the music is part of the scene or it's diegetic, as Fran brilliantly told me. Um <laughs> And I don't know, I really enjoyed that because it's just like you said, it seems like everything was thought, was thought to be in the movie and there's a reasoning for most choices that they make and I really like that. Yeah, I agree. Um, however, and backtracking a bit, we know that putting the fear of God into people does not a hero make. Um just like in Batwoman, Gotham needs a beacon of hope. And spoiler alert, a beacon of hope he becomes. Did you find it as satisfactory as I did to watch the Dark Knight step into the light? I really liked uh, Bruce's journey throughout the movie and uh, how he was kind of self-serving in what he was doing for Gotham. He was clearly double-crossing as detective and... Vigilante because he was kind of collecting evidence to figure out his parents' murder. Mm -hmm. So for him to eventually understand that what he did needed to be made public or a little bit more public because he was never going to reveal his identity. When he saw the effect of what he was doing in the shadows, uh, what that uh, rippled into with the Riddler and his followers and how they thought he, as a vigilante, who was going kind of against authority, 
had no one to stop him and so for him to eventually become a beacon of light and that comes with more responsibility and a bigger uh and more moral obligations as well so i really like that uh progress and also that scene when he gets really violent after the adrenaline shots and you get that same debate that is usually done in superhero movies about how you can cross that last line and go into murder because that will make you just like them blah 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 so that was the last moment when he was when he finally decided that he needed to become something greater than just some someone was lurking in the shadows and that his time as the batman um as the unknown batman was coming to an end and i really liked that entire journey throughout the movie mm -hmm. i see what you mean but i raise you uh how cool vigilantes are <laughs> um when they kill yeah like <laughs> so um, true seriously the thing is i really really enjoy uh complex characters uh multi-dimensional characters like i said before i really really enjoy it when a character who is not particularly good yet he follows what he thinks his moral compass is saying is the right thing to do mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i uh i really really enjoy those type of characters who aren't particularly uh working with the police or with the government or whatever it might be um but they are doing their own thing much like daredevil um mm -hmm. yeah but but i just saw a scene on instagram today that was from the daredevil finale where also you have like kingpin yelling at daredevil like kill me and then daredevil says no i won't because you will not make me cross that line like you will yeah. not ruin me but that's the thing um, the, the main difference between marvel and dc as well in marvel you don't see superheroes uh killing that's the thing about the avengers specifically the avengers is that they won't cross the line of killing uh and we don't really see that in dc we have darker characters with darker motives and in a much darker setting uh and mm -hmm. world in general so for me it would make a lot of sense obviously i can't expect for batman and bruce to stay this brooding vigilante who is uh just doing his own thing that's not gonna happen because well that's not the batman story um mm -hmm. but yet i really really enjoy a character such as this one where they are still uh in the shadows and doing their own thing and going against the system and yet not entirely against the system but working with some people in this case alfred uh, uh not alfred um jim gordon yeah so i really really enjoyed seeing this side of bruce while still uh seeing his uh internal conflict mm -hmm. but i i'm not sure if i have a negative um opinion about him becoming the beacon of light but i definitely have a tendency to enjoy these darker moments for these vigilante characters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think it will be interesting to see going forward how he is going to manage uh the two sides because he obviously has a lot that he's going through now with finding out first of all he lost his parents and he was an orphan really early mm -hmm. but then he also yeah. found out that his parents weren't squeaky clean so i think he yeah he has this new role now that people really look up to him and you have that whole scene in the lady that's going in the helicopter and he has to be the one that tells her that it's okay mm -hmm. so the people of gotham now really trust him and look up to him and i think that pressure might be we will see in the second film yeah. might be too much to handle yeah. because it's not he's not used to it so i think he's gonna fuck up but i don't know mm -hmm. I, I how agree. the second film is gonna play out i definitely agree that uh i don't think at all he's gonna he's gonna be able to handle it as well as we think he might because he's also a very introverted and um not calm but he keeps to himself a lot mm -hmm. so i don't think he likes 
to be in the spotlight. Uh, even though he tries his best to uh, take care of the people around him in his own way, like you said, with the helicopter scene with the lady. And yeah, he definitely realized that he has to be more than this shadowy figure who is walking the streets at night. But mm -hmm. I don't know, I really, I really find it exciting that yeah, we I see where saw you're coming. this side yeah mm -hmm. i see where you're coming from with that because uh especially with saying like he's not a very public person but in order for the batman to really become a beacon for the city he's gonna have to be um he can't just lurk in the shadows anymore if he wants to cause a real impact in changing mm -hmm. the city's perception of him and you know maintaining that so it's definitely gonna be a challenge for bruce i think at least if they do keep um true to what they've built in this movie so yeah i agree with you that he's probably gonna struggle with that in the future since we are talking about the wayne manor i have to say like i love how they went above and beyond with it with the gothic style because it was such a dramatic place like you could almost expect gargoyles to show up at you know some nook or cranny in the house and I think that was not a smart decision. I don't want to say clever or anything like that, but it was definitely a choice and it made a statement because who else but the filthy rich to be living in such a place? Yeah, I thought it was really funny, actually. <laughs> Because it's literally called, like, gothic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a gothic Please. manor <laughs> in Gotham of all places. And I don't know, it just looked sick. I mean, it didn't look cozy, which I also think it makes sense. Like, we know Bruce maybe had a good childhood up until his parents died, but it seems like this very detached place... And to be fair, he does use it, like, as a place to go to sleep and that's it. It's not, you know, it doesn't give off that impression of a house that's lived in. And I wonder if that was part of why they chose it. It seems like this very, I don't want to say neutral, because there's certainly an aura to it. But, you know, it doesn't feel like a home. It feels like headquarters really despite him living yeah. there it is i i think uh it works as both headquarters and a home i think it really fits bruce really well <laughs> the evil He's like well i'm Boy. just gonna take off my little special uh contact lenses and then i'm gonna <laughs> head to bed and play some switch <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and when he walks into the room with sunglasses on, and he's like, dude. <laughs> Please, that was so funny. <laughs> yeah. The light. Little moments like that, that's the comedy I, I enjoyed. Like, these little moments of just dumb nonsense. Um, and speaking of dark, though, this film made a sweet job out of tainting the Wayne's reputation, uh, as Fra mentioned, by airing out some rather dirty laundry and involving Bruce's parents with both the mobster families of Gotham, uh, as well as the Arkham family. One could even say that the archives have been opened. Badum ding, ding, ding. <laughs> On a serious note, though, I really enjoyed that. It definitely added some extra flavor to have the Waynes be not as squeaky clean as once thought. So, Fra, I know that was something you really liked in the movie. What was your, like, big moment on that? Uh, I was really excited when uh, they went deeper into the Arkham family, obviously, because of our little podcast and what we see of Arkham in Batwoman. It was, uh, it's always cool to see. And I had no idea that, I don't know if it's the same in the comics, but I had no idea that um, Martha Wayne had anything to do with Arkham. But uh, other than that, it really reminded me of the Joker, the 2019 Joker, because Bruce Wayne, um, sorry, because Thomas Wayne is also a piece of shit in that movie. <laughs> so it, it is probably kind of a recurrent thing with him where Bruce eventually has to face up to the fact that his dad was also part of Gotham's problem and not exactly um, 
an upstanding citizen. I think, though, that he did have good intentions in this movie for the Riddler then to be uh, saying that they completely forgot the orphanage um, and it was broken promises. That was also really interesting because I feel like a lot of what's done in charity is just for cameras and flashes and mm -hmm. for campaigns and whatnot. So that was cool. The entire commentary on... Uh, rich people. <laughs> on, yeah, on rich people and just uh, government people, authority, all of that was, was really cool in the whole movie. And I hope that Bruce kind of breaks the stereotype now. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with everything you said, Fra. It is uh, quite interesting to see uh, Bruce finding out that, yeah, he said is part of the main issue, one of the main issues going on at Gotham. And I, I really am looking forward to seeing how that will unfold. Mm -hmm. Same. I like the scene, I keep talking about it, but I really like the scene in the hospital because Alfred did say that uh, Thomas was a good man who made a mistake and he ultimately did it to protect his wife and to protect his family. And it gets you thinking that, you know, he shouldn't have paid with his life for it, but it's still interesting that they had Bruce come mm -hmm. to that realization. And uh, yeah, I really like that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like I said, everything is very well connected. Every character is given like a good and a bad side. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that they said he's a good man who made a mistake because how many mm -hmm. people are in jail currently because they were good people who made one mistake? Because sometimes yeah. one mistake is all it takes. So yeah. true. It's true. Um, and also, I uh, maybe it's not the fairest comparison, but I can't help but also compare it to Tony's storyline uh, in in Iron Man. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I feel like their uh, upbringing had a lot of similarities. Both of them coming from uh, really rich backgrounds and with absent parents at some mm -hmm. yeah. some degree and suddenly finding out that these people that they were looking up to turned out to be not such great people after all and they mm -hmm. are contributing to the problems that they are now currently trying to fight against yeah. so yeah. so i feel like i can help but compare those two situations because at the end of the day these are both two characters who are just uh, trying to do the best they can uh, in their own way, but still fighting against their internal struggles with accepting uh, their family and their struggles and their mistakes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm also glad you've been mentioning Alfred Pennyworth uh, because I feel like this movie showed once again that he's the only real family Bruce still has left. And I'm really glad that the Batman decided to exploit that because, you know, as we said also during this podcast, Bruce is not a man of many words, but then watching that scene between him and Alfred at the hospital definitely tugged at the heartstrings. Um, it's painfully clear to me that our favorite butler had nothing but good intentions, but in the end, he just wasn't quite equipped to be the father that stepped up to a child mm -hmm. who lost both his parents. So were you satisfied on that front, like on the Bruce Alfred storyline, or do you think the film could have done a bit more with that? I, for one hand... Uh, would have enjoyed seeing a little more of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, especially uh, after we mentioned The Dark Knight, I think The Dark Knight uh, did a much better job solidifying Bruce's and Alfred's relationship and uh, Bruce's dependency on Alfred emotionally and with everything else. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I feel like their relationship was definitely more evident throughout the Dark Knight than it was here in the Batman. We obviously know who Alfred is, uh, because at least we have all, all have watched um, the Dark Knight. So yeah. we all know who Alfred is and his he's role in Bruce's life. 
but I don't think this this film uh, created quite the obvious evidence um, of their relationship as much as I would have liked at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I thought the I thought the version this version of Alfred was um, was updated because I feel like the Michael Caine version of the Dark Knight is kind of tired now like we get it he's British <laughs> what, what, blah 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 mm -hmm. but this one felt more modern he felt like um, he could be kind of more of a friend to Bruce than exactly a father yeah. that's more of the vibe that I got and I like that he was brutally honest with Bruce and uh, said what he needed to hear I think that's always mm -hmm. been Alfred's position uh, in uh, Bruce's life but uh, yeah, I was very glad that he didn't die because we didn't, yeah. at that point of the movie, we hadn't had enough scenes of them both. Yeah. So when he was uh, alive in the end, that was really, that was uh, relieving. So I, I'm i looking forward to seeing more of him in the second movie. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to add that I'm someone who enjoys and Anna isn't here in this episode, but... Anna and I are both big fans of found family tropes. So mm -hmm. uh, Alfred uh, and Bruce's relationship with Alfred being more of a father figure was something that I was looking forward to. And it's not that I was disappointed uh, because it, uh, like we've been saying, everything made sense. But since Alfred is a character that I do enjoy... I would yeah. have liked to see that a little bit more explored, but I'm also not mad about it. Mm -hmm. I guess what I have to say about that is the Batman director's cut when. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Three hours is not enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, if the Lord of the Rings did it. Um, as we know, Alfred isn't the only relationship Bruce has in this movie. No, I'm not talking about Selena. We'll get there in just a second, I promise. Um, I am, of course, talking about James Gordon, Bruce's, ahem, the Bats partner in crime. Something like that. Anyway, what did you think about their relationship and how James put his job on the line for a random dude in a mask he's known for two years? I loved it. I love how at one point they, it was just like the two of them against the world mm -hmm. like they were mm -hmm. the only they they were the only people that the other trusted that was really funny to see i love that whole scene in the interrogation room mm -hmm. where yeah. uh he has to punch jim in the face that was really funny uh and i i really love how much they trust one another like it was almost cute like i was i, I was almost awing mm -hmm. when jim was like you're the only one i trust i was like oh cute <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, I really liked it. I really liked this take on um, on on Garden as well. Mm -hmm. Again, just like Alfred, I felt like he was more modern. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that scene because another moment that I really liked between them was when they went to the orphanage, and uh, Jim draws out his weapon, and the bat is like, "No weapons," and Jim is like, "That's your thing, dude." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy their relationship. What about you, Kika? They're their own people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I agree with you both. I thought it was really cute. And it's not like two years is a short amount of time. I feel like it's enough for you to actually uh, build a good friendship out of. Um, yeah, I just meant that, you know, he's asking Jim to trust him. And, yeah, and not basically question put him his... at all, just yeah. putting blind trust onto him. And, yeah, and he can yeah. even, you know, trust Jim with his identity. That's yeah. where I, what I found. I mean, not funny, but interesting and the true testament to their relationship, maybe, that Jim was willing and ready to put his, um, his job on the line for yeah. him. Um, also, I think his character is uh, a, a little more important than we might be giving credit to, um, because uh, out of, outside of his household, as in Alfred and probably the lady housekeeper, um, <laughs> we Bruce doesn't have many friends. Mm -hmm. um, 
even silly. That's his bestie, y'all. <laughs> so I think the fact that they became friends means a lot more because, well, first of all, they are just fighting alongside each other. But mm -hmm. also, uh, it's like his one trustworthy relationship, as in friendship, <laughs> uh, outside of <laughs> uh, the people that he grew up with. Uh, it's like his only actual friend, and not just, obviously, like Selena, who eventually became a love interest, but started out as a kind of love-hate relationship. But with uh, James Gordon, uh, their relationship was always genuine. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it was important for him to actually have someone he trusts outside of Alfred and the housekeeper. Yeah. Yeah, and I think consider considering how rotten Gotham is, mm -hmm. um, I think they're just clinging to one another because they know that that one person is going to stay. Yeah. Uh, straight yeah yeah throughout. yeah mm -hmm. for sure like they know they won't be corrupted by everything that is going on at gotham and at least they have that one person they can trust and that they are proud and comfortable to actually rely on and call a friend mm -hmm. yeah okay so it's finally time to get into the one and only selena kyle as you may know, this isn't a tea channel, despite being run by very nosy people, so we won't be discussing all the controversy uh, surrounding one Miss Zoe Kravitz at the moment. Sad. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe someday we'll turn into those people. <laughs> um, I, of course, enjoyed seeing a new iteration of this iconic role. But I'm your host, so I want to know, what did you think of Zoe's Catwoman? Uh, yeah, I think this is where my kind of unpopular opinion comes in. I loved her. There's no denying that she uh, had a, re a huge pull. She was very charismatic. And um, Zoe did a great job. But I think at the end, I didn't think that she that her Catwoman brought anything new to the what the portrayal has been of Catwoman uh, this far. She was very much the love interest and yeah, she did get some depth to her than the, other than just her sex appeal, but she was still very much treated as a sex symbol and basically the only relevant female character in the entire movie. So coming off of a take on Gotham where women are simultaneously the most important heroes and the most important villains with Batwoman, Selena felt more of the same. Yeah, she played an important enough role, but it still felt like she was there for the appreciation of the many comic book mm -hmm. bro dudes that we've mentioned who would be watching the film and very much getting off on her character. Yeah. And the fact that she worked at the bar and then uh, Bruce made her flirt with all these important men for information. He was pushing her even when she was visibly uncomfortable. That also didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. I know this might be me being too much of a snowflake and when I was watching the movie I was like okay let it go it's not that deep it, this is real world like we're seeing real dark stuff so at some point people just need to do those kinds of things but yeah. with the history that is attached to those kinds of things it still made me uncomfortable when he was like go back to him go back to him and she was like no I'm done and she was really freaking out so I didn't particularly enjoy that experience but I mean, it didn't ultimately keep me from giving the film five stars, but now in hindsight, in that we're discussing this topic, um, I don't think Selena was revolutionary in any way, but I loved her still. Like, she's very cool and she's very sexy, obviously, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I didn't think that she was all that. Um, I know you actually uh, thought I would probably uh, disagree with you. But I, but yeah. I don't. I mean, I, most of my admiration for Selena came from her being played by Zoe Kravitz and looking like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was the bro. Yeah, uh, we turned into the comic bros. Yeah, literally. Yeah, we, I was the male audience. <laughs> Um, but, you know, um, when when Zoe said she played Selena bisexually, she meant that this is for the female gaze and the male gaze. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's perfect. 
Um, and speaking of which, uh, one one thing that I did enjoy, even if it was pretty much only confirmed by Zoe herself, was really regarding her bisexuality and her clear relationship with Annika. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that was that was actually a little small detail that I did enjoy because it's not like we see um, their dynamic being completely uh, shown off, but yeah. we clearly also see that they had something else going on and that it wasn't just a friendship. Um, I thought it was pretty obvious and... Honestly, if anyone at the theater uh, watched the film and thought, oh, uh, no, Selena and Bruce, yeah, the only relationship they'll ever get because they both like, <laughs> uh, they're both straight. No, it, then you're delusional. Um, I agree, but I'm also kind of done with, also, with it always being a, a question. Yeah, yeah. Was she, wasn't An she? An undertone, just... like uh, the undertone. Yeah. Um, I think, actually, in this film, it was more obvious than probably in other films where we see uh, the, the actor saying, oh, he's definitely queer, and then you don't get any evidence at all in the film. <laughs> yeah. They're just completely making it up for clout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in this particular case, I think it it was pretty obvious, and anyone who who didn't see any of that is probably just someone looking at it from a heteronormative point of view. Mm -hmm. It's true, but she did refer to her as friend constantly. Oh, yeah, also true. But I mean, she was like, "I'm here for my friend. I'm here for my friend." Yeah, nah, nah, she was my friend. And at this point, I'm tired. Like, just say, but also, say what you mean. but also. I feel like probably that also happens in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. But enough about Annika and Zoe. Um, <laughs> and Zoe, not Zoe, Selena. But um, I I did like Selena's character, but I also agree with what she said for now. I don't think she was a revolutionary character. Um, regarding the specific moments at the Iceberg uh, Lounge, is that the name of the bar? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think shocked me nearly as much or made me uncomfortable at all. She is someone who works at the bar. She's certainly done a lot of that and more um, since she has been working at the bar for quite a long time, uh, we can imagine. And uh, about what she said about when she was saying she didn't want to go back, that was mostly because she saw Falcone, not because the experience was making her uncomfortable. She just didn't know how to act and how to get information out of those people because she also had her own personal uh, vendetta to take care of. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think the fact that she suddenly saw Falcone and was also dealing with the clients and trying to get information out of them, which it, she doesn't do very often, was what ultimately uh, made her leave the bar. Not exactly Bruce trying to get her to, yeah. to be a little more sexual with her mm -hmm. customers. I, think, I just think that the whole concept of having a man order you to go flirt with a dude is just not my thing. I think the movie could have done a lot better. I think they did a lot better with modernizing um, other characters that have been stereotyped and trope typed mm -hmm. uh, into oblivion. Like, we've done a bunch of Alfreds. It's always like a very quirky British dude. And then, uh, we've done a bunch of Jim Gordon. He's always the very outstanding uh, police officer. Yeah. But they were both kind of actualized in this movie. And then with Selena. At least she was given a little bit of background, fair enough, like we know her family now and she was kind of bisexual, kind of very thinly, but she was still like, yeah, I'm hot and I'm going to use yeah. my body and I'm going to use my sexual, sexual appeal. That's kind of my superpower and I'm very independent because... Yeah. Um, I play men with my sexuality and it's always been kind of that superpower that 
we kind of see these very side characters, the only female character in a very dude bro mm -hmm. movie. She's always like, I know that men only see me for my sex appeal, so I use that against them. Yes, it's been done. Uh, yeah, I see what you mean. And you're absolutely right, but that's that's comics for you. I mean, this is a character that has been written uh, a long time ago. And, and Catwoman's yeah. always been like that. I yeah. think it's true to character. Uh, yeah. She's a seductress, and that's how she gets a lot of things done. Um, and as far as the that one scene with her and Bruce at the Iceberg Lounge, I kind of felt like Selena in general served the purpose of humanizing Bruce a little because there's a lot of shit he wasn't aware of that she made him aware of like with that scene at the Iceberg Lounge he's just trying to achieve a goal and he's not really thinking about how she might feel about it because you know he doesn't think about sh shit like that when he's the one uh, trying to get the information. He just wants it at any cost. And Selena mm -hmm. wasn't having that. And she let him know that she wasn't comfortable. And she said, I'm not doing that sh this shit and I'm not doing it. And another moment was when he was being kind of judgy of her on the roof and of her methods and calling her promiscuous and stuff like that mm -hmm. and she's like you know i did what i had to do to survive because yeah. not all of us are born with a silver spoon exactly uh so i appreciated the character in that sense i know it she doesn't seem revolutionary because that's always been who batwoman was oh batwoman <laughs> mm -hmm. that's always been who catwoman uh was even from uh the few comics i've read and um even from the Harley Quinn show. That's very much who she is. And, you know, but it didn't bother me that she wasn't a revolutionary character in this movie because I did feel like she was more than just the romantic interest to Bruce. Like, sh a lot of the movie, they didn't have... Uh, and we're gonna talk about it in a bit. They didn't have, like, a strong romantic feeling to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, she was yeah. very much... I think they did. Yeah, I don't think they did for there most movies. Yeah, there yeah, was the a tension. She was like, I have a soft spot for oh, strings. Come on, like, that, you know uh, what she meant. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. for most of the movie, you almost... They didn't kiss, I guess. No, but you also see <laughs> her kiss, kind like, of fun. use him... You also see her kind of using him as a means to an end because, you know, she wants to get revenge for what happened. First, she wants to find out what happened to her friend and then she wants revenge for what happened. And she's ready to cross Bruce at any moment to get that done. So I really didn't start feeling the undertones until, I mean, of course, I saw some of them in their early scenes, but... I didn't feel it was reciprocated until, like, <laughs> a while into the movie, you know? Um, no, I disagree. I thought, I felt like they were going to start making out every time they were they shared a scene together. Maybe that's just Zoe and Robert's chemistry, yeah. but... <laughs> um, I feel like the main issue here, and I think we can all agree, is that the, the main problem with uh, utilizing and reutilizing the same characters is that at the end of the day you cannot change their core so mm -hmm. at the end yeah, of the day uh selena as much as you might change her even with bruce at the end of the day he's still bruce he may be played a little differently than uh christian bale's bruce or any other bruce but at the end of the day it is still the same character and mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's true. Selena will always have that uh, base of her being a sex symbol and being the feline who is gathering all everyone around her, and she will always be that character, whether you like it or not. So unfortunately, they they can't really shift the character around because well. That's the problem with adapting an already existing, existing characters. character mm -hmm. to uh, any other type of media. 
medium actually mm-hmm. yeah i do agree with you that you know there's source material here and if you stray too much from it you will end up with a character that's not the character you started out with so yeah overall i think the the movie achieved uh a reasonable balance with it yeah, i think you guys raised great points in the end i think it's very true that if you have a source material then they're not going to be able to do much with it and the problem is with the source yeah, material exactly. mm-hmm. and then i just have to accept that selena carl is never going to be a character that i resonate mm-hmm. with much but mm-hmm. you're absolutely right it is an overused trope it is um unfortunately that's also the the source material that they are working with and they they are choosing yeah. to work with because in this case selena will probably get her own uh story in her own development but they are choosing to to pick selena up because of batman um they mm-hmm. are not yeah. just choosing a random um female superhero which they could do but they are choosing to pick selena because she is ultimately attached at the hip to bruce yeah, I mean, you can't True. think of one without the other at this yeah. point. Um, Unfortunately, she has to exist because he exists. Yeah, but I also feel yeah. like this movie kind of opened up with her leaving in the end to go to... Where was it? That? Blue Bloodhaven? Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like they opened the door. I mean, probably the next movie won't be a Catwoman solo, of course, but I feel like they opened... The possibility to develop this character, you know, like yeah. she now doesn't have the ties that she did to Gotham and she doesn't have revenge in her heart or whatever. So I feel like there's definitely the possibility for her character development there. And I'd be very interested to see her return in the future. No, oh, me too, for sure. I mean, there needs to be one female character, at least, in the yeah. movie, so... <laughs> Even if... Yeah, if not in a Batman movie, who knows? She might get her own little spin-off, or even a TV series. I mean, Zoe is also a TV actor. Mm-hmm. She's been in series before. Yeah, and the Penguin is getting a show. Exactly. Right? Yep. If Penguin is getting a show, I think Catwoman also would deserve to get her own show, especially because we see that open ending for her. I know a lot of the criticism of this movie has been that once again we have a superhero film that decides to entangle itself with a romantic relationship, but personally I did like Bruce and Selena's will they want they partnership and I feel like I mean you apparently disagree with this, but I feel like the romantic undertones despite being there of course weren't like shoved into your face all the time and i feel like i personally felt that way because you know it felt like they were on a mission most of the time that they were together and they were at odds for like half the movie and then towards the end of the movie i liked the little twist of selena being the one to save bruce and not necessarily the other way around Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, I feel like they, the navigation of, okay, let's have romance, but not make it too extra was, you know, they achieved a nice balance with it, in my opinion. It didn't like take away from the movie is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm a sucker for romantic plots. I don't mind them at all. But I think it comes down to what we were saying before. If this is your source material and if you are choosing to in- to include Catwoman, then she's going to have to have a, re- a romantic relationship with Bruce. Mm-hmm. So, but I really loved the way that they did it in the movie. I really felt the chemistry. I thought Zoe and Robert are great together. Mm-hmm. Um, their rela- their um, individual personalities fit really well. I like that. Selena plays with Bruce's uh, introvertedness. Mm -hmm. Uh, She enjoys it and she likes mocking him and uh, trying to make him a little more comfortable and loose. Uh, I thought they worked really cool. They they worked really well together and I look forward to seeing more. Yeah, I I agree with both of you at the same time. Um, We see, uh, I see 
both of your sites, mostly because I agree with Inej that it wasn't such a an in your face type of relationship that we usually that we are used to seeing in in these blockbusters. Um, there is always a romantic uh, interest. There will always be a romantic interest. So I enjoyed that it wasn't completely in your face and it was a little subtle while also being quite obvious that they would be a romantic, they would be in a romantic relationship at some point, at some degree in the film. So definitely like Fran said, it was obvious from the moment she talked about always being fond of strays <laughs> um, but also they weren't always making out or they weren't always living for each other. Each of them had their own yeah. personal uh, thing going on and they just helped each other mutually. Yeah, and I honestly think that, you know, peeping Tom scene aside, Catwoman wasn't overtly sexual around... Batman, like she wasn't constantly flirting with him and some stuff that sometimes we see in the comics. Mm -hmm. So it was tasteful, I think is the word. I agree. Yeah, I agree too. As we talked about, Catwoman served as a lot more than just a sidekick or side piece to the Batman in this film. We actually got to learn quite a lot about Selina's background, her family, and her current relationship with some of Gotham's finest, including one Carmine Falcone. So, what did you think about Carmine's uh, involvement in the bigger picture? Uh, that was one of my favorite things about the movie. I, I know this actor from another show, and I was really excited to see him in the movie. I didn't know that he would be in it. So when his character eventually got a little more protagonism, I was really excited and then it gets kept snowballing until the big twist in the end that he had been the one to kill uh, Selena's friend and uh, also Bruce's parents. And that was one of my favorite like independent storylines in the movie Carmine's because you slowly learn more and more and more about him and then eventually have his big demise in the end. And um, Selena's storyline added a really nice touch to it. And um, the fact that he probably has a bunch of other children he doesn't <laughs> even know about because of everything that he does. And uh, yeah, he got, he got what he deserved in the end. And I really, really like this character. So all in all, Falcon is a fuckboy. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and he also killed Selena's mother, right? Like, she said something. He said something about that while he was choking her out, I think. Well, he certainly is not a saint, so I wouldn't <laughs> put it past him to just kill a random woman she he slept with. True. Yeah, I think he was like, your mother also got a, a bit too loud and look what happened to her or something like mm -hmm. that. So he definitely gave it a, a little bit of an idea that he might have been a little more involved in what happened to her. Yeah. But Falcon wasn't the only criminal ringleader we got to see in this movie. One of my favorites, in fact, was Oswald Cobblepot, or the Penguin as we know him. Uh, I think Colin Farrell was absolutely unrecognizable and outright delicious yeah. in this role. So, do you have a favorite Penguin moment? Yeah, I, th I mentioned the, the one where he corrects the Gordon in uh, Bruce's Spanish. That's mine. <laughs> um... I don't think I have any particular uh, favorite penguin moment. I know Inej loves the the one we mentioned before with uh, <laughs> his feet tied, but I think he was a really solid character throughout the film. He had really funny moments. He was he was a he was a cool antagonist. <laughs> I feel like he was positively insane during that car chase scene. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And also how you kept mentioning how Bruce is insane. He was like, this guy is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like running away tra also in traffic, uh, hitting other cars, uh, creating these big accidents. And he's like, no, man, he's the one who's fucking out of his <laughs> mind. The fuck? <laughs> 
<laughs> That's Penguin in a nutshell. And, uh, and I mean, in the end, Penguin kind of got what he wanted because now he's the big boss of Gotham. Yeah. Excited to see how that will play out. So with all of that, do you have any interest at all in the solo series that DC has announced for him? I mean, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair. <laughs> That's my answer. Um, I, I, uh, I don't think it comes off as a surprise to any of you, probably to your listeners, but I <laughs> don't watch TV series like at all. Uh, anymore. You watched I, Yellow Jackets, okay? I did watch Yellow Jackets, uh, mostly because I'm out of boredom, um, but gladly, I I did enjoy <laughs> uh, Yellow Jackets a lot, but uh, I don't watch many TV series anymore, so... Glee broke you. I definitely uh, will not be watching it, but, I mean, who knows? Uh, I might just get interested enough to sneak in an episode or two, but um, he's a fun character. I, did, I just don't think I enjoy him quite as much as mm -hmm. everyone else in the film. Yeah, I, to, yeah. I preferred Falcon to, yeah, to the same. Yeah, Absolutely I was same. about to ask. I was about to ask if you could give any of the characters in the movie a spin-off, who would you pick? I mean, I think it's Dead obvious Selena. <laughs> yeah, me too. That would be my pick. Either Selena or yeah. Jim, honestly. Same. I also really like the president lady. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't care about her enough to for her to get her own show. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she was, she was cool. More protagonism in Batman yeah, 2. Yeah, like, <laughs> get it. Uh, so this brings us to the big bad guy of this movie, the Riddler. Uh, it's very funny to me that this character is practically an incel with way too much time on his hands. So, you know, your run-of-the-mill <laughs> incel. Uh, and a crush on the bat, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, even though in the end he wasn't nearly as scary as I thought he would be, I absolutely loved some of his riddles and the dark humor that they brought about. So... What's your overall opinion on this character and how he was approached in the film? I really, really like this approach on the Riddler. Paul Dano did such an incredible job, like we've said before. He, he's born to play these really messed up incel roles. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, it's something about his face, man. Um, <laughs> he's so good at it. He's giving in so uh, but I I really really enjoyed this this really funny character and to be honest how relevant is it that so much of the crime happening nowadays is based off people who have too much time on their hands and just they stay online for a little too long and they <laughs> yeah, don't have literally. anything else to say so they start talking with other incels and then they have incel parties together, so that's exactly <laughs> what happened here. No, literally, because I was watching that side of the movie, um, the whole dark web mm -hmm. bit, and I was thinking that it was just so realistic. Um, that's what was scary to me, is that literally it could happen, and it yeah. is happening. So that part I thought was really, really it creepy. It was scarily accurate. Yeah, exactly, literally. And the use of uh, social media and the use of technology, I loved. Uh, again, it felt that it modernized ba Batman. I loved the scene in the church mm -hmm. so much. It's one of my highlights in the mm -hmm. movie. I love the video call. Oh, um, I loved it so much. It was so intense. Like, right? you could feel the tension in every single one of their moves. Literally, yeah. I love that. I, I, I really like that. And the, the confusion, again, that I've mentioned between the Riddler's intentions and Batman's intentions and how the Riddler's minions uh, were quoting Batman, mm -hmm. uh, I thought was really interesting as well. Because th the lines are very, very thin between what yeah. uh, the Riddler... Uh, what the Riddler believes and what Batman believes. You can so, just see yeah, I loved that it. they um, they have a a WhatsApp group chat where they are constantly like, oh, look, I'm the shadow. I'm the vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Not WhatsApp, Discord. They have group a chat. Dis yeah, they have a Discord. <laughs> I bet one of them has like 
the change his name to Vengeance. And the other one was like, oh, but you're a genius. That is so funny. Lastly, with this being such a high grossing movie, it's more than expected it'll have some sort of continuation, especially with the Joker being introduced towards the end of the film. Do you have any sort of expectations for the future of this particular franchise? Uh, it's nice you mentioned the Joker because that's simultaneously something that I am looking forward to and not so much just because it's been done so often and it's a very annoying character and we've seen it it's been done but at the same time they picked a character um, an actor that i really like and that i think is one of the biggest promises in hollywood at the moment mm -hmm. so i actually want him to have a chance to show what he's got in this character so yeah i'm torn uh, on that regard and uh Yeah, I, I'm very excited to see what they can do. I hope they continue as a detective type of, of mm -hmm. film and uh, keep up the kind of criminal drama genre. Mm -hmm. I, I think I share the same, the exact same wish as, as Fra, mostly because, like you said, it's something that has been so over overly done. The Joker, he... That character has had so many um, hit and misses that uh, yeah. it's actually kind of scary to see which one this one will be. So because at, at the same time, everyone uh, thought, oh, Joaquin Phoenix, he'll do a great job. And turned out that many people did not like this version of the Joker. So... Um, at this point, I'm trying not to have many expectations of his character. Yeah. Because, again, it's been so so done and overly done that at this point, I'm just waiting for it to happen. Uh, but, I mean, come on. It, it, it's about time that uh, DC uh, starts introducing more characters and more plots Because they certainly have a lot of exactly. a lot to choose from. It's uh, the Batman has been around since what 1939. I bet he's he's fought many more people other than the Riddler and the Joker. So they can just pick up from that. Yeah, and I mean DC, in my opinion, stands out because of its villains. So. Yeah. Using the Joker over and over and over and over and over again yeah. feels kind of like a waste when there's so many to pick yeah, from. Yeah, they are dismissing uh, their good villains. I feel like Marvel has really, really strong superheroes with strong moral compasses, but in DC shines because of its villains and by mm. just picking the same one over and over again they just they're dismissing every single other character and villain and antagonist that they have maybe they're just not as not as complex maybe they're not as complex characters as the joker because of how much content he has but mm -hmm. i mean there's still so much to choose from Mm -hmm. And I mean, they don't have to be complex. They can just be fun, you know? Yeah. Like, watching the Riddler and his riddles was fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I don't have many expectations. I feel like with the superhero films, as even though I'm a big fan, most of the films that I've been watching are superhero films, um, but they certainly can be a hit or miss. So I'm trying mm -hmm. not to create uh, many expectations, but I sure hope they do continue to have the same tone as this Batman did. Okay, so that brings me to my very final question, which is, has this reignited your faith in the DC Cinematic Universe at all? Um, 
Has it, Fra? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think so. It's like you were saying, it's very, very hit and miss with the DC Cinematic Universe. Because when Marvel puts out a weak movie, at least you get a kick out of seeing the kind of connections with the other ones, spotting the Easter eggs, thinking about how uh, this will impact the universe and the rest of the storylines. Mm -hmm. When when I say Marvel, I mean the MCU. I'm not saying the, yeah. the X-Men movies or... Uh, Venom or whatnot, <laughs> but with DC because they're all disconnected, uh, they really have to stand on their own, and they've had some really really bad ones. Mm -hmm. And when I read this question, the first thing that I thought about was that my favorite movie, superhero movie, is still Wonder Woman, the first mm -hmm. one. But then the second one was so terrible, so so bad. Like mm -hmm. I can't even believe it was made by the same director. So it's literally like you have no idea what comes mm -hmm. with DC, like. It's like Kiko was saying, there's every chance that the Batman 2 will be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. uh, I know this has not reignited my faith in the DC <laughs> Cinematic Universe. If anything, it's made me even more confused and even and more skeptical. scared of... <laughs> yeah. It's like, if they can pull off a Wonder Woman and if it, they can pull off a Dark Knight and if it, they, they can pull mm -hmm. off a Batman... But they also give us uh, Suicide Squad and Wonder yeah. Woman 1984 and Aquaman and stuff. Then you're like, what the hell is is am I? What the hell am I supposed to expect? Yeah. <laughs> I have huge trust issues yeah. with DC. Uh, so thank you, Kika, for coming to the podcast. Thank I hope you. you liked it. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed my presence and my rantings. Yes, we did. <laughs> we absolutely did. Uh, and we hope you may come back one of these days, you know, to another special or just to guest star in the podcast. Fingers crossed, we'll never know. <laughs> we'll leave the door open. <laughs> As for everyone who's taken the time to listen, thank you for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed this special episode of Arkham Archives. We have more things planned for Batwoman's hiatus, so stay tuned to our socials on both Twitter and Instagram at Arkham underscore archives. See you soon, Arkhamites. Bye! 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 Bye.